Hello everyone, in this video I will be installing everything that needs to go onto the 2AR FXE engine and preparing it to go into the chassis. The first thing you can do is remove the flex plate and replace it with a flywheel from a Scion TC. It is likely that if you buy the transmission from a recycler, they will include the flywheel with it, like in my case. If not, used in aftermarket is plentiful. To remove the bolts, I wedged a small wrench between one of the dowel pins and the wooden beam I had on the floor. This makes it so much easier to remove the bolts instead of trying to hold down the crankshaft from the other side. After you initially break them loose, you can undo the bolts while holding down the plate with your hand. This step is not necessary, but I had the time to do it. You don't need to sand down your flywheel surface as the rust will go away eventually, but it just gives me the peace of mind knowing that the mating surface will be flush and it looks nice. You can use a wire wheel or low grit sandpaper if you wanted to, but make sure to use brake cleaner to remove any oils or dust left behind. If the clutch surface is not free of oils, you will most likely have issues with clutch engagement. The new flywheel bolts I got seem like they have some thread locker from the factory, but I'll put on some just to be safe. You must torque the flywheel bolts in a star pattern, otherwise it will not sit flush to the engine. I used multiple passes so that one side wouldn't lock up and not mount flush. An example of how to do this is tightening all of the bolts to 20 foot pounds, then let's say 45, then finishing at the factory spec of 72 foot pounds. Next is the clutch and pressure plate. Because this engine will be making much more torque than stock, you will need a clutch kit that can support if not surpass the extra torque requirement. I used an ACT organic heavy duty street kit that is rated to 310 foot pounds. In the clutch kit, they include a small pack of grease to lubricate the transmission spline. This is to prevent the clutch from seizing on the transmission shaft and not being able to disengage it. A good way to make sure that you lubricate all of the spline crevices is to lubricate both the transmission shaft and the inside spline of the clutch. This ensures that all of the grooves have grease in them as the bumps of the transmission spline will go into the grooves of the clutch and vice versa. I used up about half of the pouch. Exceeding the grease amount needed can cause it to fly out and get on your clutch, resulting in clutch slippage. The pressure plate has some protective oil on it to prevent rust, but make sure you remove it before installing. After temporarily installing the clutch with the alignment stick, install the pressure plate, but don't torque it just yet. When you center the clutch, try to align the splines so that they point in the same direction as the transmission splines. Unless you have someone to help you, it'll be very difficult to rotate the spline to line up with the clutch when you install the transmission. Aligning them now makes it so that you have an easier time later. Also make sure to shift the transmission into neutral. The pressure plate needs to be torqued in a star pattern to 14 foot-pounds. There's a few things left to do before mounting the transmission. First, replace the throwout bearing. ASIN has some good quality bearings that are worth it in the long run. Even if you have recently replaced the bearing with an aftermarket one, it's worth installing one from them. The small hydraulic line should be put on beforehand to align properly. Then tighten the bearing with three bolts to 17 foot-pounds. They should be new bolts and make sure that they have Loctite on them. Torque the nut to 11 foot-pounds. Next is the mating bolts. Of all the parts, these were the most difficult to source. You can try getting them from a dealer, but they won't have the majority of what you need. If you haven't parted out a Scion TC, you can get them from a junkyard or order them online, but make sure that they are the right metal grade. In my case, I got some from a transmission shop and then cut them down to the right length. This picture shows you which bolts you need. The last obstacle is the dowel pins. These are what initially align the transmission and the engine together. There are two spots where they go in, but there should only be one at each location. Because this transmission was never installed with this engine, it's likely that the dowel pins are in the wrong locations. Some spots won't have any, and some may have two that will interfere. If you don't remove one of the interfering pins, you won't be able to install the transmission. In my case, one of them was slightly damaged, and that prevented me from mounting it to the engine. I used an angle grinder and ground it flush later. I had to lift the engine to install the transmission. There are a few places to hook up the ratchet straps. One is on the right side motor mount. Another can be used if you insert a long bolt into the transmission side of the engine, right under the valve cover. The one I used to stabilize the motor was a stud that protruded from the exhaust side. To make it easier to align the transmission, 
you can use two 10 millimeter bolts that are 100 millimeters long. Cut off the heads and insert them in these two locations on the engine side. These two holes don't get covered with the transmission case, so there will be no problem inserting bolts in them now and removing them later. Cut a small notch into the bolts so that you can use a flat head to remove them if they do get slightly bound. The transmission was a bit of a struggle to install as there isn't many good locations to lift it, and it's quite heavy. It will get tiring to mount it if you take too long to align it, so I did was I marked the alignment holes on the transmission side so that I can easily see them and line them up. When joining the transmission, you must make sure that the splines have lined up with the clutch before you torque down the bolts, or you might break the clutch. The transmission and engine surfaces should be about one centimeter or less from each other. To know for sure if these splines have aligned, you can shift the transmission into gear and rotate the crankshaft while observing the axle holes to see if they rotate. If they don't spin, you might have to line up the splines again and start over. I put in a few bolts to hold the transmission in place while I made sure. Just two bolts at the top with a few turns should be fine while you allow yourself to install the rest. The important thing to know is that the splines have lined up before subjecting them to several hundreds of pounds of force from tightening all of the bolts. After installing and turning all of the bolts to just finger tight in all the proper locations, you want to go around in a circle and tighten each one only slightly. You don't want to slant the transmission forcefully by torquing it down only on one side all the way, just like the bolts on the flywheel. So make sure that its face is always parallel to the engine. Follow the chart pattern after the surfaces are completely mated and torque in the order shown. One of the top 12 mm bolts needs to have the black shift mount installed. It has a small extrusion that fits into the adjacent bolt hole. Slide the spring clip on it and torque it down along with the other bolts. The other shift mount can be installed later. Now you can install the three transmission mounts. Starting with the rear mount, you must grind away the small notch on the engine that would otherwise interfere with the transmission mount surface. Since it's aluminum, it's not difficult to remove. The notch should be flush with the mounting face, but it's okay if you grind away a bit more. It doesn't have to be perfect, just as long as it doesn't interfere with the mount. You can install the starter now or after the engine is in the car. There are a few versions of the starter that work with the shift kit. Some are slightly longer than the others, and those ones will interfere with the other shift mount. So make sure you get one with the right part number. What I'm installing right now is the bleeder valve and hydraulic accumulator. Your transmission may already have these, but I got mine from a recycler and they had removed them. This part is meant to let the clutch pedal work better. But if you don't install it, you will need to make a longer clutch line. Between them is a hydraulic line, but there are two versions. The longer line skips right over the anti-dump valve, which you don't have to have installed. The valve reduces drivetrain shock if you were to drop the clutch. I don't think I'll drop it, so I'm okay with not installing it. If you did want to run it, there is two shorter lines that go on it. One goes to the accumulator and one goes to the bleeder valve. Either way, the custom clutch line hooks right up to the accumulator. On to the accessories. I'm cleaning the dried gunk off the rubber gasket for the water pump housing. It's important to get this off as it won't let the rubber form correctly and may result in a leak. The mechanical water pump housing fits here just like on the non-hybrid engines you can get this housing used. Then install the actual pump, which should be new. ASIN also has these. This also bolts on and gets torqued in the pattern. Don't forget the thin gasket between it and the pump housing that should be supplied from a manufacturer. Next is the custom AC compressor mount. You could install an AC delete idler bracket if you didn't care about AC, but it's not hard to install the stock MR2 Spider compressor, especially if you have the first generation smaller compressors. You do need to grind away that small pin before installing the mount bracket. Also, while the engine is up and dry, you should replace the oil filter. This filter has a hole on the bottom where you can use a socket wrench. Next is the thermostat, and then the custom coolant housing. The heat sleeve and pipe that connect to this go on later when the engine is in the car. Next is the alternator. One of the mounting points is shared with the water pump, so that's why you had to install the pump first. I'm using a remanufactured alternator. 
Also, not a good idea to install a used one as it is one of the first used parts to fail. Then this coolant bypass tube. There is a gasket for it, so pay attention to that. It's difficult to install this after the header is mounted, so install it now. And now the header. Make sure that the contact surface is smooth and rust free. The nuts should be OEM locking nuts as they do get very hot and you don't want vibrations undoing them. You can put on some anti-seize but it's not a must. Also torque to 30 foot pounds. This small sub harness that connects to the knock sensor needs to be replaced. This version of the engine had an intake manifold with no tumble valve. But the harness that you need combines the knock sensor and tumble valve into one plug. So you have to replace this small wire to properly attach everything. That small plug connects to the rest of the harness. The knock sensor may also need to be replaced because of the plug shape. After cleaning the mating surface, while I can still easily reach it, I installed the fuel rail with two bolts. There might be a small type of snap connector still connected to the end of the fuel rail. This gets replaced before installing the new custom fuel line. If you don't have the tool, you can use two screwdrivers and pry out the inner seal to remove the connector. Make sure you have the right gasket on the intake manifold before installing it. The individual sections should look sort of like a trapezoid while the hybrid intake has square ones. I installed the six bolts and tightened them in a star pattern. Don't forget the PCV line like I did. This connects to the engine block right behind the manifold near the knock sensor. Between the intake manifold and throttle body, there is a small gasket with a metal mesh attached to it. You can remove this mesh with some cutters but return the gasket to its place. Cutting this mesh should let in enough air to allow a few extra horsepower. The rubber line I have between the engine block and the bypass tube is incorrect. You would only want this to be hooked up this way if you wanted to race the car as it would otherwise heat up the throttle body. I fix this later by connecting them to the proper locations on the throttle body. Next is the custom dipstick. Because the header is in the way, we have to use the MR2 Spider dipstick tube. The tube has to be slightly bent to fit in the oil pan hole. Because there is a large bend in the tube, you can't use the 2AR dipstick that came with the engine. You can use the 1ZZ Spider dipstick because it's a cable, but it has a different fill line location that's a few inches longer than the 2AR. To correct this, you can mark the correct length that matches the 2AR line, cut the 1ZZ line at the crimp sleeve, and re-crimp the metal sleeve after lining up the mark. There is a metal sleeve running underneath the whole rubber boot, so you can crimp anywhere on the sleeve. It's hard to show, but you have to bend the tube using trial and error until it sticks out flat beside the valve cover without touching anything else. To mount the dipstick, I used the old 1ZZ bracket and bent it to the shape I wanted, then use the random hole on the side of the engine to mount it. You don't want the tube to be bent much higher than what I have here or it will interfere with the chassis. Next is the harness. It is totally unnecessary to do this, but I removed the tumble valve, O2 sensor, and automatic transmission wires from their plugs and pulled the wires through the entire harness. This was just to reduce clutter and make it easier to find the wires I needed. These amounted to about 40 wires, so it was worth the cleanup for me. I'll show what I did to modify the harness in the next video. The reason I have so many wires sticking out is because the swap currently needs an aftermarket ECU and I need to rewire the ECU wires, which I plan to do after the engine's in the chassis. The connectors are very straightforward. Everything lines up where it should and you don't really need a guide to put them in place. Most connectors have different shapes so it's hard to mix them up. There are just a few nuts holding down the harness corners and two bolts for the two ground wires on the engine block. Next is the fuel fitting. Here I'm snapping on an Earl's 516th quick connect to AN fitting. This gets tightened to the rest of the fuel line later. Make sure that you can't easily pull it off. The O2 sensor should have some heat sleeving installed. I'm using a wide band so it has a much longer cable here. I install this now but it's better to do so later when the engine's in the chassis as you will need the extra room to install the coolant hose. This sensor came with anti-seize on it but you have to put some on if it's not on there. The axle carrier bracket can be installed later, but I have it here so why not. It's about $70 new. They are rarer at the junkyard than you may expect. This just needs 3 bolts and there are 2 bolts that hold the axle itself to the carrier. And now the engine is all ready to be put into the chassis. In the next video, I'll be covering the harness modifications. After that, the chassis can be prepared for the engine install. Thanks for watching.